Hey folks, glad you're here with us today. Today, the title of our show is Why You Need to Focus on Music Licensing. And we have a lot to talk about here. So we're gonna go ahead and get started with just our weekly updates and talk about what's been going on with Steve and I over the past week before we get into today's subject. Steve, what's been going on with you this week? Okay, well, um, last week was, uh, was really interesting. And I think I'm able to talk a little bit more about uh, the composing contract uh, that pretty much had me on lockdown <laughs> and uh, off the grid for the better part of uh, last week. I think um, if there's one takeaway that I had from this whole experience, and this will tie into the uh, the topic of the today's podcast too, um, is we should be all posting our work on YouTube and social media because uh, you never know who's listening. Uh, or who's watching um, some of those you know uh, that are listening some of the people listening to this podcast know that I've uh, and uh, you know they, they've been following my YouTube uh, channel for a while and they know that I post up the occasional orchestral <clears throat> remix of uh, popular songs and I think the first one I did was uh, the weekend's blinding lights uh, and that one has quite a few views uh, now I think it's up to like uh, uh, over 20,000 uh, views now so uh, and by the way anyone with a YouTube uh, channel doing remixes is, is a great way to uh, boost your overall watch time uh, which is good because eventually you need a certain amount of watch time to uh, monetize your channel but anyway um, a little while after that first remix I did uh, a remix an orchestral remix for Olivia Re Rodrigo's uh, driver's license track um, which was probably the biggest song uh, the number one song this year Really fun to do. Literally, you know, spent probably two hours uh, on that remix. Uh, I, I posted it up on YouTube and never really gave it much thought after that. Uh, it just so happens that Google was planning on licensing that song um, to use in their 2021 year in search video, uh, which they do every year. And Your uh, version? Uh, no, uh, the, uh, Olivia's track, but I'll get to how it worked into my version. But um, yeah, so they they wanted the the master of her of her track. Uh, this is a big project for them. I actually never really even knew about it until they got in touch with me. But these videos get like hundreds of millions of views. Um, some of the previous years like have like over two hundred million views. It's crazy. The one that they just put out the the twenty twenty one one already has like fifteen million um, views. Oh. So it's 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 a big deal. Um, Anyway, so Google wanted to license Olivia's track, but they also wanted to do an orchestral instrumental remix of it. And it, so they wanted to combine, you know, the stems of the of the master um, with some orchestral elements. And I get I presume that they, you know, searched online for uh, orchestral remixes of the song and just found mine on YouTube. Um, so they got in touch with me and asked me if I'd be interested in um, working with their creative team uh, on this and doing some revisions on it. And of course I said, yes. And you know, the rest is history. So um, there's a lot of really interesting production details about the gig that I'll maybe share with the Academy and I'll, and I'll open up the session and share that with the members that, uh, you know, um, that would be really cool. Yeah. They can take a look at some of the stuff I did and, and, and you know, uh, in terms of the orchestral arrangement. Um, and I don't want to take up too much time on this, on this update, but um Look, you know, let me just say that when Google comes knocking and like asks yeah. you for a quote on this type of job, you can, let's just say you can ask for what you're worth and then, you know, maybe double it. <laughs> and, yeah, right. and look, you know, at the end of the day, I, I didn't even get credit uh, in the video description, which is, which is a shame um, considering how many views it gets, but not surprising considering how many people were working on this project. I'm just one of many, many people. So um, in, and in fact, they didn't even end up using all the music that I sent them uh, in the final project. It, it, it was It's a collage of, of my stems, the master stems, and other people's work too. So um, anyway, that's what kept me busy this last week. And now it's all wrapped up and I can relax again and catch up with, uh, with other stuff. And um, this is kind of, yeah, you know, it was, it's, really, it's a really good thing. It's one of those once in a blue moon gigs that can you know, really set you up for a while. And uh, it just simply never would have happened had I not posted up my work online on YouTube. Um, so there you have it, you know. Um, go check out the 2021 uh, Year in Search video on YouTube and uh, you can hear some of my, some of my uh, orchestral work. So yeah, pretty cool. The YouTube thing is, is so, um, 
I do a lot of YouTube videos, especially for clients. Mm -hmm. A lot of videos for their music videos, either their their lyric videos or whatever. And they're so time um, consuming yeah. because you're trying to really put something cool together. But I would love to do that for every song that I have, but I have so many songs yeah. that I, I don't have time to barely do one or two, much less the 10 or 20 songs I'm working on every week. And uh, and I mean for stock stuff. You see people putting stock videos out, uh, videos with their stock music with imagery around it to try to sell more people yes. on their stock music, you know. And yeah. I've done a few of those, but I just don't have the time because I need to spend it on the piano or on uh, pitching or on well, you gotta, all that you got to pick your battles. But, I mean, on, at, by the same token, you're, you're putting yourself out there on YouTube uh, talking about, you know, music licensing and income. I mean, that's all part of the same thing, you know. You're projecting yeah. um, and you're leveraging the power of uh, social media in a way that's uh, healthy and, and yeah. effective for you. So, Yeah, I have heard people talking about not using social media for almost anything but posting work to and and that's about where I am with social media I, mm -hmm. I rarely spend any time looking at it unless it's like a, a family or a personal post I put up which I only do that once in a life once in a very short while I'll put a post up to friends or I put a thing up about this video I saw to some keyboard friends on Facebook you know and I'll just right. I'll keep an eye on that and see if anybody says anything but I just don't have time to look at social media I have time to post stuff to social media for them to look at, but not for me. To, I don't have time to go look at stuff myself. Yeah. So, uh, and I think that's probably the way we should all, as, as creators, be using social media the most. Now, there are times I'll sit down and watch YouTube for an hour or two and catch up on videos, but that's more like watching TV rather than like scrolling down Instagrams and things like that. So I don't do that. Yeah, well, I think there's, you know, uh, I do worry that, that social media has kind of like a net negative effect on society, I, you know, but that's another conversation. I think, um, yeah, I don't, I don't engage with social media that much other than just to use it as a tool to, um, to share my work and to share my thoughts uh, with the world. And, and, you know, I think that I've kind of established a pretty healthy relationship with it at this point, so... Well, good. I'm glad for you because you need to get to work, Steve. Yeah. Um, <laughs> speaking <laughs> of work, um, one of the things I'm doing right now, and I, I kind of announced it on my newest video that I put out today. I put out a, a video today called Holiday Music Matters. And um, I think it's going to open a lot of people's eyes about different things they can be doing, uh, especially public domain. People just do not even think about public domain music as something you can put into libraries, but it's like a whole world of music that's sitting there waiting for you right. to do your own version of. And But anyway, I you've talk done, about that. You've done that. a lot of this remixing the public domain stuff. I have done a lot. Probably 25% yeah. of what I have on stock music is public domain stuff. That's very cool. And uh, I make a lot of like I make a lot of money with it. But yeah. one of the things I announced, I gave a lot of gifts away. I, I shot it by my Christmas tree. And uh, I'll just say this, because this is funny. I, at least I think it's funny. I was sitting by the Christmas tree and shooting this video. And I said, now you may think this is like a Christmas video. And so it won't apply if you watch it later on. But believe me, this is really evergreen material. <laughs> and <laughs> get Christmas tree, evergreen. Okay, That's moving bad. on. Um, dad joke. But one of the, dad joke well, alert. As my daughter says, dad joke. But uh, yeah, I did announce that I am doing one-on-one -on -one coaching for clients. And one of my clients, as we talked about last week, is doing rather well. And this week, it's blown completely out of proportion. Oh, yeah? You think she is averaging almost, you know how you can average in motion array like dot two o of of the amount of sales that you get. Yeah. And that determines how much you're getting. She's getting close to, to 30 Thirty percent, or dot thirty, you know, dot three zero, whatever that is. She's getting thirty percent of the of the the music revenue. Well, I don't know. If she's getting thirty percent. She's getting dot three zero, which is oh, 3%, sorry, sorry, maybe. Sorry, maybe it's three percent. Yeah, but anyway, uh, still, it's netting her somewhere around. Uh, gosh, I don't know, thirty, forty dollars a day. She is yeah. really crushing it with, and it's one song. She's only got five songs on Motion Array. Yeah. And now she's, now she's got six, but one song is just taking off, this sleigh ride song. 
And uh, boy, she is raking in. She's already made 200 plus, maybe on her way to $300. It's just the ninth. And uh, so she's in uh, Stephen Bedall territory uh, with uh, Motion Array this she's month. In the $50 uh, a day club. <laughs> I don't know if she'll get to the $50 a day, but uh, she's not doing bad for someone who just started several weeks ago. That's and, awesome. Um, That's awesome. So my month is kind of down this month, but I, I realize again I'm in that place where I didn't put enough up, and mm. I didn't get all my Christmas music in that I wanted to get in. And that's a, her song is a holiday song. It's a sleigh ride song, so it's it's perfect for putting behind your uh, your videos. But Good anyway, um, yeah, and I have new videos up. As I said, I have a holiday the why holiday music matters. Uh, video up and then last week's video was being the music artist or being the artist in your music even if you're a producer or if you are in music licensing or whatever which is what we're going to talk about today mm -hmm. i have six taxi pitches pending so we'll see what's up with that um i i'm excited to see what happens with a few of them because a few of them were percussion post pitches where they really wanted percussion real live percussion and i hired a, or i brought in a drummer from nashville to do these really uh, intense drum solo things. Oh, and nice. so I'm excited to see what happens with those. If not, we're turning into a whole library. Um, I just got out of a Zoom where I am tracking country songs today in Nashville, not because uh, I, I do most of my tracking in Nashville, but this just happens to be a country uh, tracking session for an album I have with, um, with my library at uh, Sony BMG. And so excited to get that really kind of going and um yeah that's that's how my week's been going so far and uh, much more to it but i think we should move on into our main topic today which is why should you be focused on licensing those of you who are listening you might be any kind of thing you might be a producer you might be an artist of some kind you might make your own music of some way you're a, uh, a composer a producer an artist a songwriter you could be a lot of things, but why should you focus on music licensing? And if you're listening to this podcast, you've probably uh, been thinking about music licensing or involved with music licensing. But I think it's very important for anyone who's not to know that this is the direction you likely need to be heading because there's only so much gigging you can do. And there's only so much merch sales, as you said a minute ago, that you can do. So mm -hmm. I want to just tell my story and I want to tell the story of an artist but what are your thoughts on this initially and 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 when did you know that music licensing was going to end up probably being one of your bigger pursuits yeah this is really an interesting question and you know this is coming uh it's it's a question that's um you know and coming at an interesting time in my life because I'm someone that was on, you know, the road touring uh, for a long time. And, uh, you know, I know what kind of toll that takes on your body. You know, I, I know how difficult it is to, you know, to, to sell merch and, and, and to grind um, on that level. And, uh, you know, I think that being a performer, being in a, in a band does require some uh, degree of youthful energy. <laughs> um, and, you know, your, your body and your, and, and your your mindset changes as you as you get a little bit older um and i think that when things shut down with with covid i mean it's we no one ever really saw that coming especially you know all my friends who are in the in the music touring world um and you realize how how vulnerable you are in that respect and you know how we've been taking everything for granted for a long time so when I saw that there was an opportunity to uh, monetize the production skills that I've acquired uh, through, you know, just messing around with Logic and and uh, writing demos, uh, you know, this, that's what I use Logic uh, and Pro, actually it was Pro Tools that we go back far enough. That's what I used it for initially was just to make demos for my band. So that's how I kind of learned it. Yeah. Um, when I realized that that was a, you know, uh, a skill that I could monetize uh, through licensing, then that was just such a game changer, a light bulb moment, you know, went off in my head. So you came at licensing really from the artist side uh, as you started to get into producing. You you kind of were artists, then started to mess around in producing and then 
came to licensing. I it was, was. It was all happening at once, you know. Uh, there was so much because, like, I I got into licensing. I knew I understood the value of licensing be, well before like COVID hit. Like, I, like back when I was in a band, you know, we had um, we were. Uh, we had a relationship with a, like a, a supervisor and we'd made some inroads with uh, with licensing our music. And I and I knew that I had friends and peers that were doing really, really well in that respect. And, you know, that was like always in the back of my mind. But once um, COVID hit that that whole the whole idea of it, like accelerated, like immediately, of course. Yeah. For me, I was a producer working for clients for the last 20 years and about three or four years ago I heard a podcast where someone was talking about music licensing and and why you should be thinking about getting your music into TV and film and all that kind of stuff Mm -hmm. and from what I understand this is a common way people find out about this they either find about it out about it in a podcast like this or they find out about it in uh, a, a course that they're taking or they find out about it in a book and they and, and it suddenly just like hits them like a ton of bricks. Wow, there is thousands of dollars to be made with songs that I already have or that I can produce to put into this industry and it is only exploding more and more. And I don't care if you talk about the sync licensing stuff for TV and film and ads especially, or if you talk about stock music, I think all of those are still expand, expanding exponentially. Mm-hmm. And so it it became my focus over the past three years or four years to really focus on that kind of music and prepare it to the point where once I had it all ready, I did get signed quickly to uh, a Sony BMG library and then got more stuff signed. And then, you know, there's my whole story about getting signed, which is on my site at makemusicincome.com. In my YouTube page, I have a story about this. And I also had an interview last week with Tamara Bubble, and we talked about that last week. And, you know, she found out a similar way. She was in a course, and she got to the third section of the course, and they started talking about licensing your music to TV and film. And she was like, I'm done. <laughs> she didn't I'm, that's all the course, the course I need. <laughs> I don't even need any more in the course because that's what I want to do. And I think once people yeah. hear about the amount of money that you can make from this, especially if you do it right and you have good quality productions, then there, it's a no brainer that that's where you need to be focusing because yeah. uh, I, I'm about to give up the artist thing. To be honest with you, the artist, uh, Finding artists, producing them, and marketing them is one of the hardest jobs on earth. And unless you have deep pockets as a record label, they're not going to do very much. Mm-hmm. And uh, so it's it's a little easier with licensing to just figure out your road and then go after it yourself. Yeah, and 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 Tamara, it was also kind of sounded like she was burning the candle both ends with like trying to uh, you know do shows and 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 was she touring at one point well she yeah she was when she got the idea she was a cpa and when she got the idea to be a music artist in the first place she was doing everything from busking out in front of arenas to trying to sell cds on the street and sing out loud in the air to try to get people to look at her and listen to her and she tried all the different things, yeah. all the ma- hire a manager, hire a publicist, hire right. all these kind of things, things that we've all done as artists in, in at some point. And she, so she just kept searching for that way. And she found for her that licensing worked as, as the music business for her. It basically mm-hmm. became her music business. She didn't need a music label because she had music on television shows and in films, and those became her label, and those became her her way to reach out into the industry and, and, and find fans that could then find her, and it's just, I think it, so that's just from the artist side, and then I, I've heard stories of producers, and I'm an example of that, who have taken their productions and have decided instead of just making these for artists or for me and putting them on Spotify and making YouTube videos and hoping that it does well, is actually just pitching these to companies that need them. Now, this is a big business and there are a lot of people out there trying to do this. There's a lot of competition, but quality gets through 
And yes. when a company hears quality, they know it fast. Yeah. And because most of the stuff they're listening to is bedroom produced, low quality type stuff. And that's just because people are trying stuff and throwing it, you know, out there. Yep. And when they hear quality, they instantly know it and they put that to the side and say, okay, I need to get back in touch with that. This is why I'm always telling whatever. people to, to go back to focusing on the quality of their productions because this is how you stand out in, in, a, in a crowded space. Because I mean, like, you know, 80, probably oh, more than 80% of the music that gets submitted, uh, you know, to these libraries is um, not subpar, but it all kind of, you know, I mean, I think you get, I, th I think these libraries get like an insane amount of submissions. And when they hear that one track that's just like really, really stands out, I mean, they want to work with you. I can only imagine. I asked for some country songs last week for these country sessions I was doing this week and next week. And I got the country, the, the worst country gospel type things that you could get. Really? Now, for those people, they're, they're fine. And for their audiences, they might be fine. Yeah. But for when I ask for contemporary country and I get back a country gospel song that's recorded very badly, um, it, it's, it's hard to tell these people why they're not having more success. Um, other than to say your quality is not great, but you know, you're trying to be nice. They were just sending you an email. It's the same way with these libraries. They don't, the reason they don't get back with people, it's not because they, they um, don't want to. They want to. They just don't have the time to. And anything they say is going to come off as really hurtful, uh, even if it's not hurtful. Your music does not fit what we're looking for. That can sound like a complete insult to a hardworking composer who spent their last dime on a demo that they made at a friend's house, you know. Uh, and so. I think yeah. that uh, it, finding it is is one thing, and, and this goes for, and you're right, quality goes for sync and it goes for stock as well. I mean, stock music, you're starting to find, especially in libraries like Motion Array or Audio Jungle, that there's a high bar there. So Yeah, it's um, getting higher. Yeah, so you, your quality's got to be really high, which is where something like, you know, your production music academy comes in where they can really learn how to make quality recordings use quality plugins and quality instruments and all that kind of stuff I think that is is more important than ever and uh, people need to be learning and knowing better composition skills knowing better production skills especially if they want to try to produce this in their home yes. and then send it to these companies yeah yeah it's easy it's easy to do to to produce in your it's easy to you know like all the software that we have um, makes it really simple to put to put music together um, but you really have to be I mean look you know all the taxi listings it's like at the end of each one of them it's like broadcast quality it's like is this is this track you're creating broadcast quality I mean like you can use the best plugins the best um, you know VSTs but um, there's a lot of subtle detail in in the mix and the production process that um, accounts for something being broadcast quality. And, and this is likely only the, uh, the only other thing I'm going to say about taxi during this podcast, because we tend to talk about taxi a lot. I love, yeah, I well, I'm into it too. I, I'm <laughs> <laughs> so I know a lot of people are like, oh, why do we have to talk about taxi? But I know. Um, one of the things that I have heard people really enjoy about taxi is the fact that they get to pitch to these briefs. And then even if they don't get um, forwarded on. They get to listen to the songs that were forwarded on okay. and they can hear the difference in what was forwarded on and what this particular person thought was better quality, better song, better pointed song for that brief. And so yeah. I think that's pretty important that you can see what succeeded when yours didn't. You don't get that by just sending your songs off to um, music libraries or publishers and never hearing back. All you get is no. But here you get no, but here's why I'm not forwarding it. And then you can go and look at what was forwarded that month for that particular listing and listen to it and say, oh, okay, I see I see what's going on now. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe there's going to be times when you go, uh, I don't know about this. I think mine was probably just about as good as that. But 
uh, from what I understand, especially with beginning writers or beginning people pitching, it's been really helpful to them to see what did get in and why theirs didn't and get feedback on why theirs didn't. So, yep. all right. Yep. So, um, you know, I think we need to get into incomes a little bit here. We've talked last week about our incomes, but when we talk about licensing income, this is what we all want when we get into music, especially when we want to put music on Spotify or YouTube or whatever, or we want to put songs into stock libraries, or we want to get songs into TV and film. This is what we call passive income. We made it once, we, we sent it off, and if it gets used, sometimes it can get used over and over and over again and make us money while we sleep. Everybody wants passive income. So this is another big reason why licensing is really, really uh, attractive to me as a composer who wants to spend my time composing and have income coming in from passive sources. Mm -hmm. Want that performance so. royalty income. I mean, when that starts adding up, your your track gets, you know, on a TV show that it gets a lot of re reruns or replays or whatever, um, that ends up being big money over time. Uh, well, or, or little money consistently. Yes. Uh, piling yeah. up on top of other little money. Um, yeah. As we know in stock income, it can be pennies, but if you play a penny stock for enough uh, and spend enough on it, you can make some some money on it. And so it's not much different then. It's funny that it's called stock income because if you pay penny stocks, it's a little similar to that. Yeah, it sounds, <laughs> it sounds like a video. Anyway, um, so yeah, that's that's one reason why I think you've got to think of licensing as, a, as, as an income stream for yourself just because it could be a passive income that will allow you to do if you want to still be an artist and go out there and, and focus on the artist stuff. But you can have the licensing stuff working for you on the side. Or if you're a producer and you're making your money producing for people, then you can have passive income from licensing that way. So. Yeah, and I mean, I think it's worth, I mean, I mean, I th I, everyone's lis listening probably knows this, uh, but Passive income is not to say lazy uh, income. I mean, it, it passive income requires a lot of investment and a lot of work and a lot of time. Um, but it's the idea that uh, you know these things that this work that you can you do can grow, and uh, and a song can be licensed multiple times and find multiple different placements. Um, so hey, it's no different than writing a book or putting out a CD back in the day, or uh, any kind of investment you make in a thing that you're going to sell, once you have the thing made and it's out there, then it's all passive income at that point, unless mm -hmm. you need to promote it. And in this, you don't need to do any promoting for it. Yeah, so. yeah, yeah, it promotes you. Um, another thing that I, I've heard from people and, and seen is, is um, an unexpected bump in Spotify sales and in online sales and streaming and all those kind of things because people are hearing those songs on television shows and many songs have become hits just based on being on a certain television show at a certain time, a certain Netflix movie or a certain uh, TV show that's very popular and there's a big song on it. Imogen Heap basically made her career, I think, off a of Grey's Anatomy mm -hmm. song one time uh, that really... Uh, was a boost to her career. And those are those are things that can be fringe benefits, um, especially if you're an artist and you're really working hard on Spotify. And so, um, oh, by the way, speaking of Spotify, I've got an, an exciting interview with uh, Tom Dupree oh, coming cool. up uh, tomorrow that the video should be up next week. And Tom is a Spotify hacker. Uh, mainly he's a hacker of uh, by Facebook ads and, and, and learning how to get more Facebook uh, people going to Spotify, which is a real trick. It's a mm -hmm. real art. And uh, he's also a drummer and he makes many uh, different kinds of music income. So that's gonna be interesting to talk with him. And cool. then there's another guy named Andrew Southworth who also does that, uh, except he's even more of a nerd about it. So I'm hoping to get an interview with him as well. So exciting stuff uh, coming up there about Spotify sales and in, and income uh, from that. Nice. So. I'm definitely looking forward to that. I mean, being on Artlist, I think we mentioned this last podcast, but 
uh, the exposure that I've got through there has boosted my Spotify monthly listeners from like zero to a thousand. I never really put any thought in Spotify before. So have you seen income from Spotify this year because of Artlist? Well, yeah, there would be. I don't, I don't know what it's at because I'd have to go into the distro kid. Um, like I'd have to go back and take a look there. I think they calculate it quarterly or something like that, but yeah. um yeah, it'll be some there'll be some money. When you do your art list reveal, whenever that is, when you get told by art list how much you made for the year, yeah. it might be also interesting for you to look at your distro kid Spotify and come and say, "Hey, it's this has to be added to that because this was a result of art list." Good point. That, which is again the point I was trying to make in that you've you've put this licensing stuff out to Artlist and it has increased your Spotify following. Yep. So yeah, that's pretty cool. Yeah. And, and other people reached out to me through the Artlist exposure as well. Like people have reached out to me through Instagram um, and email and asked for uh, some custom work here and there too. So there's a lot of benefits to that exposure. And I mean, it's the I, same thing for, for sync licensing placements. Like you said, you know, Imogen Heap's whole career was probably based off like a few key placements in a, in a hit TV show. Those kinds of placements can be huge, career-defining. Uh, well, it helps that moments. it's a, an amazing song, uh, the one right. that was on there. But um, uh, so anyway, um, and I think also producers who are listening to this podcast, if you produce for people, you need to be thinking about. And this is something I'm kind of thinking about for 2022: is how to refocus my production clients, my music artist clients who are the clients of for me as a producer or a label and focus them into licensing mm -hmm. so that I can co-write with them or write for them and then they can see that kind of income and again it's just our the subject of this whole podcast is focusing on music licensing and it'll likely be the focus of our podcast in general but just because that's what we do although I'd like to talk on this podcast about lots of different ways to make music income but uh, we'll be talking about licensing almost every podcast just because that is uh, the golden goose and it's already paying us now. So, yeah. um, and in some cases paying major bills, you know? So uh, anyway, any other thoughts about music licensing or why we should focus on music licensing before we move on? I think you've uh, kind of wrapped it up there. Uh, that's, I mean, yeah, you made some great points and uh, I'm excited to, you know, to keep hacking away at these taxi briefs. We won't go. Uh, we won't go back into the taxi vault here. But uh, <laughs> you just have to say taxi again. I'll, I'll be sharing some of my uh, <laughs> some of my work that I'm, I've been writing. I'm, I'm working on two briefs for taxi uh, currently, and I'll be sharing those with the academy um, soon. How enough, much so. are you spending on them time wise so far? Um, I'm being a little bit more careful than I would normally be. Actually, um, yeah, yeah, maybe t spending a little bit more time. Uh, with with the stock stuff, I kind of tend to just like get it out the door as fast as possible. But uh, um, maybe just because I'm new to the taxi thing, and maybe well, you no, know. I think you're smart to approach it that way. Yeah, because yeah. Uh, you, you don't want to waste time. But um, the the better you get, and the more forwards you have, the more possibility you have to make relationships with libraries. Well, I think it's, so I, it's it, that, and it's just, you know, if I'm paying for the membership and I'm, I'm paying to submit these tracks, then I want to, you know, uh, put my best foot forward and, and, and ensure that the, the money's going, is getting, you know, uh, the most, I'm getting the most out of my, uh, my investment here. So, um, so yeah, like, you know, a forward would, would, would be nice for, uh, yep. for all the tracks. But um, yeah. we'll see. We'll see how it goes. We'll see. We'll, we'll compare uh, our ratios. Of yeah, yeah. How many done to how many forwarded and see how that goes. Yeah, um, yeah. I think I gotta, I'm about I gotta due catch for up another. With you, man. You got... I'm about due for another four. Well, I've only done like 25 songs and I've only had a lot. two forwards, but I haven't heard from six of those yet. So okay. um, we'll see uh, how we, how we kind of go. Uh, I was a little careless with some of my submissions this time i was a little bit like i put a few things in that i didn't create for the forward that i thought were very close and so okay. we'll see if they have any chance all right so i want to move to another section that we have been wanting to start for a few weeks and that is kind of a question and answer time from different people that we talk to and mm -hmm. 
you put that question out to your Production Music Academy and you got some really great questions. Yeah. I, I threw it out the last minute a few hours ago or maybe an hour ago to our folks on our Discord and uh, I don't think I have anything uh, from that. But if you've got, uh, do you want to start could, uh, here with question one or you want I mean, Yeah, I'll start that. with a question. Um, and yeah, maybe we can address some of the Discord stuff uh, on the next episode. Uh, okay. But we got some great questions here from yeah. uh, a few of the Academy members. So we'll start with uh, uh, Mike's question here. Um, yeah, actually has three questions. Um, one is, do you think certain types of music work better in certain libraries? Uh, if so, how can you tell uh, what would work uh, and sell in a certain library? This is a really good question. I assume he's talking about stock libraries or is he talking about... Well, I think he might be referring to stock libraries, but we could yeah. address this in... Um, in in all libraries, well, it's easier to address this question with stock libraries because I think when you like, if you take a few like key examples, like if you go to uh, Pond Five or Audio Jungle, for example, the tracks that are going to come up first in your search are probably the ones that are selling uh, the most or the most popular. Like, because I'll you know the algorithms are going to push it to the top um, with. Like, you know, if you go on an art list, for example, and you search and you do the same thing, you search in, in cinematic, uh, whatever, or folk music, like you're going to find the ones at the top are the ones that are doing well, even though uh, you can't actually see the sales stats. Um, you can probably rest assured that the ones that are at the top of your search are the ones that are being downloaded the most. Um, so that's one way to kind of get a sense for um, what's doing uh, well in a certain library. Um, some libraries like Audio Jungle, for example, make it incredibly obvious. You can just see, uh, you can actually just search <laughs> by sales. Um, that, I, I think very few libraries actually have that uh, that metric available to um, uh, to the customer. But um, yeah, in terms of like bigger, like more exclusive sync libraries, it's kind of harder to tell. I mean, you can you can search their, you can usually search their catalog and get a sense for what kind of music is well, on. Well, the qu the question is what. Do you think certain types of music work better? Like, I, I guess he means genres. And for exclusive libraries, my thought is that you're going. it's going to depend on the library. If it's a library that focuses on trailer music and you've got jazz, then likely that's not going to be something they're looking for. And so if you try to apply to that library and you're doing jazz music, let's say it's really traditional jazz and it's just... Um, just regular traditional jazz. Well, the trailer company is looking for trailer music, so it probably is not going to work for that library. Now, mm -hmm. on the stock side, also it's it's a very similar thing. There's going to be libraries that are looking more for for certain things, and it's going to be up to what the client's looking for. But you're right; you might be at the mercy of how their search engine works. On Motion Array, it seems to be the first thing that is most important to them is what. Motion Array thinks is good. Yeah, it's an. If, I was going to mention that. Yeah, it's, when you go to that first page, you get staff picks. Yeah, 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 yeah. Those come up first, and until you actually change the the search uh, parameters to say like m last six months or la like, then it's completely different results, and it's just yeah. you just get what's most popular and what's being downloaded. Um, to answer Mike's question in a, in a more in a kind of a general sense, uh, it, like it, in reference to the type of music kind of thing. Um, happy uplifting uh feel good music sells positive sells positive yeah. music sells better uh in libraries overall in all That's, libraries yeah in all right. libraries and in sync or stock um mm -hmm. it's always going to be positive first when i was studying and taking different courses in sync licensing they always talked about be positive yeah uh, the biggest money you can get in sync is in advertising and that is almost always positive happy upbeat music that's right not sad even though you would think oh but there's so many sad things on television well yeah there are but for the most part everybody wants that happy dance moment at the end of a lifetime movie or everybody wants an upbeat version of this or that or commercials want something upbeat so yeah there's a place for for the sad stuff there's a place it's not like you can't you know write that kind of thing but um yeah in a very general sense positive happy uplifting music sells sells better um Maybe we'll move on to number his uh, second question yeah. here. Uh, his sec second question is, how important do you think metadata is in improving visibility in libraries, and how do you go about writing the metadata for the tracks you upload? 
So as metadata, are we talking about description and keywords mainly? I think probably, yeah, it, it, all of that, all of that for sure. Um, this is a really good question too. And I think it is very important. Um, I think that, you know, your descriptions, uh, in the same way that, you know, uh, um, titling for your YouTube videos and, and what you're writing in the, in the description is very important for the search algorithm on YouTube. Um, I imagine it's probably a, a similar thing for, uh, for, for stock libraries, um, as well. I think, you know, I write very specific descriptions for, uh, for the tracks and I use, I use the, you know, the same keywords that you'll find in, in the tags. I use them in, in the description. Um, <clears throat> obviously some libraries are different in terms of like their, uh, their, um, the way you title your tracks. But um, I try to, if like we're talking about motion array, for example, where you have to do a, like a creative title. Um, I try to get really creative there too and write something that's kind of like uh, catchy or, or funny or, or kind of like a little different than some of the stuff that's, that other people are, 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 are using because you never know that might be the one thing that like is the deciding factor for somebody to click play on your track, you know? So um, in my opinion, the, t the most important thing is going to be your keywords because that's going to be what people search. And especially if it is a library that offers keywords already to you. And this is one mm -hmm. reason why I start with Pond5 every time with every song is because I go ahead and put all my information in Pond5 as like a library. But the reason I start with Pond5 is not just because of that, but because they suggest certain, they have a list of keywords you can choose from that automatically throw it up in the keyword box. And you can yeah. just go through and check all the different ones. Almost no other place does that. They just ask you to throw the keywords in. So if you go to motion array first, you're going to have to sit there and go, okay, is this sad? Is it cool? Is it? VFind does that. But yeah. It's maybe one of the VFind does that a little bit. Yeah. With yeah. some things, but I find that pond five is, is way more uh, they have a lot more to choose from. Now there could be a lot more than that. And sometimes I'll go through and put the ones I know right off the bat, Christmas, holiday, jingle bells, whatever. I'll put, you know, the things that I know and, and sometimes list the instrument that's mainly featured piano, xylophone or whatever it is. And then I will go down the pond five list of different descriptive things and click each button for what I think it is. And sometimes yeah. that can give you 30 or 40 different keywords. Now, not all the libraries let you have 30 or 40. Uh, Audio Jungle only allows 30 or, or 20. One of them, Motion Array is 20. And Audio Jungle is 30, I that's think right. is the way it is. That's right. And yeah. you, so you have to take some out sometimes. But that's yeah. why I start with Pond5. It's a little hint of how to come up with keywords when you're like, oh, I'm not sure I want to spend that time. It's almost no brain power because you could just go through and say, nope, 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 yes, 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 nope, nope. Totally. Yes, and, yes, and, yes. And up. you know what? Copy, copy. Once you got those and then copy tags, paste. once you get those tags in the little box there, copy, paste them, uh, put them onto a notepad. And, and then just reuse them. It's just that I don't easy. even think you need to do that. I just call up Pond5 when I'm putting stuff in Motion Array right. and copy that description out of there and plop it in there. There you go. Copy the tags right yeah. out of Pond5 and plop them right in there. Sometimes you have to right. trim a few out, so you take out the ones that are less perfect for it, and then you go. And, and so, and I also I also use like description templates uh, as well. Like you know, I'll have like a few um, kind of descriptions, like general ways of describing tracks. Um, and because I upload a lot of tracks that are similar, um, I'll just copy paste the description and then change a few things. So just to save me a little bit of time. So it's like in YouTube where you can go ahead and put in things that you're going to put in every video, exactly. including tags and all that kind of stuff. Exactly. Um, yeah. Okay. You want to hit number three question here? What is your favorite type of music to compose? What's uh, yeah. What's yours, Eric? Mine is probably something to do with piano. Mm. Uh, after that, jazz type stuff, uh, tr jazz trio, and um, probably uh, f f indie folk type stuff, strangely. Uh, kind of like uh, just instrumental indie folk stuff. I find that fun to do. Um, and also probably holiday stuff and doing different things with holiday songs. Nice. That's what I really like to do. Nice. Yeah, I think I think mine is probably um, I, I love pop um, and, and lo-fi hip hop tracks um, and anything where I can throw down a bit of guitar and bass like I love recording my own bass lines. Um, and uh, yeah, 
I think other than that, I, I get a kick out of the cinematic stuff, anything in sort of the cinematic territory, um, just because it usually requires uh, a lot more care and attention, but the, the payoff um, is nicer. I think that with the, the lo-fi and like the pop and that, that kind of stuff, it's like quick and easy and fun. Um, cinematic is, is, styles are a little bit more challenging, but um, they, they're they really rewarding. So those are my favorite uh, you know genres, I guess, styles to write in. Okay, there's another question here. Uh, what advice do you have for recording a track fast, like between one to two hours? And how long does it take you to record, mix, master, and upload a track? This is good. Good one from Alan. Yeah, uh, thanks for that question, Alan. That's, a, that, uh, that's an awesome question. Um, advice for recording quickly uh, would start with um, organization. Uh, in on the level of like getting uh, and like I know that there's uh, there's different opinions about templates. Um, I I use templates, uh, and and I, and I don't. It really depends on the project. Um, I have like quite a few templates at this point, um, which I can access easily. Uh, but beyond templates, whether or not you're you're into using uh, track templates, uh, if you're a Logic user, for example. Um, Get organized with your tracks. Uh, save your track settings. Um, don't spend, you know, five, ten minutes like trying to, tr you know, trying to load up the contact libraries and all the plugins on the channel and stuff like that. Get that stuff saved so that it's like one click away. Um, you know, just little things like that. Those little tiny things that are obstacles in the creative process. You got to get rid of them. You got to get rid of them. Other than that. I think it's really important to establish the skeleton of the track right from the get-go because that's the hard work. Um, you know, you could do something as easy as like come up with a loop, like a four or eight bar loop, and then you should immediate, immediately decide what is the arrangement of this track in, it, in, in total. Get the, get that the sense of flow uh, established in the track right away and then get to work with filling in the gaps rather than trying to take it bar for bar for bar you got to do you got to plan accordingly and i think that that's like the the big thing that um really made a difference for me when it came to when it comes to like just learning how to compose quickly and it's just it's just like get that checklist in front of you like you know and 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 be organized it's just it's really just a matter of organization i think um I am a non-template guy, so what I will do, and I'm a piano player, so usually what I'm going to do is f start playing on something on the piano. And I know guitar players who work this way too. They might work something out on guitar that has an A section and a B section, and then an A section, they know it's going to be an ABA tune, let's mm -hmm. say. Yeah. And they just play it all the way through with a click. Or you throw up a drum loop and you just jam with the drum, drum loop for um, two minutes or whatever, and you come up with your section. Sometimes you could chart it out if you need to. Chart out your chords and make a chart like you would for any song that you would do for if you're recording or if you work with a band or whatever. But I tend to um, find a, a kind of motif that I wanna work with, mm -hmm. and then I play around with it, and then I kind of come up with the B side of that the B section of that motif. And then um, there is some cop copy and pasting I do sometimes, but uh, what I would like to do is to sometimes maybe I'll find a, a, a sound on my other keyboard over here on, on native instruments or something, or a loop from arcade or something. And I'll use that and, and build something and then build it out into uh, an eight bar thing that I can repeat. And yeah. then, then, but then the, the thing that really gets it done, though, is playing, like you said, playing through the piece. Yeah. I think once you get your beat set up, once you get maybe a chord structure set up, then loop it all, put the organization of the track together. Even if you have to do eight bar loops and just stack them all together yeah. and say, ooh, that's going to be about two or three minutes. Kurt, that's perfect. And then play to it. Play over it with your instrument, whatever that is. If you're a guitar player, play over it with your guitar. If you're a piano player, play over it with your piano. And if you do this carefully, you can do tracks pretty quickly in an hour or two. Now, if you are a piano player or guitar player and a solo player, you can do tracks in 10 minutes. 
If you just say, I'm going to do an arrangement today of an old hymn or a public domain song like Silent Night, and you just sit down and you come up with the arrangement, then you press record and you record it from beginning to end. That's sure. the quickest way. That's that's half hour territory where you can just do stuff like that because everyone thinks you have to be so overly produced to put stuff in all these libraries. Yeah. I've got a solo classical piano album I am sending to Sony BMG Library. It's just one piano. And let me tell you, there's not much mixing and mastering to that. No. And you and speaking about that, from my perspective, and Daniel talks about this too, you should be mixing as you go. You shouldn't yeah. have to wait to the end to mix. Yeah, yeah, you know? uh, totally, totally. Um, great points there, man. Yeah, it's like I, I mix as you go um, and and establish the the arrangement of the track uh, at an early stage of, of the sit down, getting, you know, the, the whole process. I think that that is our takeaways here because um, I think once you pay attention to that basic level of organization, I mean, I, I get tracks, like, and like you said, it depends on the scope of the track because if I'm doing like a solo guitar thing, I could just knock that out in like, you know, yeah. 20 minutes, but... Um, and don't shy away from those kind of submissions, especially for stock music. Yeah, sometimes, we, we, yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, I th I'd say an average track from, from, from like first note to final master, it, it's an average of like two to three hours for me, but maybe three hours. Um, because there's some tracks that take like very little time, but there's other tracks that I spend, I'll spend like, you know, sometimes I'll spend a couple of days on, on, on a thing if I'm really, really like, you know, involved in it. Um, and it's, and it's pretty complex, so it can vary, I but I think m most of the stock stuff that I put out, like, yeah, those are, those are two hour, three hour things. Yeah, yeah definitely. And, uh, and, or it, I spend an hour today on it and then I come back in the morning and go, is this good? And I listen <laughs> and if it's good, I'll finish it up, you know? And, uh, so that happens a lot, but I think yeah. you should be mixing each instrument as you go. You should have a, some kind of overall, um, you know, I, I keep a L2 maximizer on my bus from the very beginning. I call it initial L2, and it basically just keeps everything under control. And uh, I keep the, as I bring drums in, as I bring bass in, I pretty much establish it at the level it's going to be. It's not going to change much from that for the yeah. final mix. So uh, sometimes if I go listen on headphones later or listen on speakers later or whatever, I'll change minute changes. But you should be mixing and almost mastering as you go. So. Yeah. Now uploading, I, uploading, and we didn't answer the the last part of the question is upload the track. Well, that can take some time depending on how many libraries you're going to do, which library you're going to choose, all the naming conventions, how fast you are with. Uh, yeah, and I, I might and suggest like I might suggest like picking a, a a day you know of the week to upload you know because up, like I don't know if I want to write, mix, master, and upload a track all in one sitting. <laughs> It's like, I have. I mean, I have, I have too. I just, it's just not times. the way I like to work. I like, yeah. I like, you know, I'll, I'll generally pick a certain time. Like, and um, there's a word for this that uh, um, I'm, I'm not thinking about right now, but it's like combining all your tasks into, in, into like, into like one thing. You know, it's like, I'll, I'll spend the morning just writing the song and then I'll move on to some other like task in my life. Batching, that's the word I'm looking for. Um, so, you know, I'll pick a certain day of the week, like Friday, uh, you know, I got two or three hours, um, allotted for just uploading tracks. <laughs> well, if you, if you have a laptop, you can just take this stuff and just completely put it as a job to do while you're watching TV and just sit on your laptop and be assigning keywords and descriptions and doing all that kind of grunt work instead of sitting at your computer hunched over it all day long, do it when you're outside or at a park or watching TVs. Another time you're going to be just sitting there doing nothing, especially watching TV. Yeah. It's a it's a great way because we don't completely pay attention. You know, we're playing games on our phones or whatever while we're watching TV. So exactly. uh, it's something you can do when you're doing that. So um, we have one more question to address here. Um, okay. and this is a pretty big one. So um, this is from Bjorn. Uh, Bjorn says, I have uploaded music to many different libraries using uh, during the last 12 months. Some of them have been successful in terms of sales and some seem to be complete a complete waste of time. Uh, maybe you can share your experiences about this uh, example, V5 motion uh, elements, music grid, 100 audio, 
WYSI Sounds, Dreams Time, and so on. Those are um, the list of libraries uh, that uh, Bjorn is uh, working with. Um, and then he has a, a list of you know which ones are working. I think uh, presuming that the, the ones that he's getting the most traction on, uh, Motion Array being at the top, uh, 100 audio uh, at the bottom of this list. Um, uh, libraries well, with no sales yet: Music Grid, Dreams Time, Vfine, Soundscape, Song Trader. I've never even heard of Soundscape. So, um, yeah, I mean, we could uh, we could definitely talk a little bit about. This is almost like a whole episode. Um, yeah, it is. I I actually started an ebook this past week on all of the libraries. In other words, all of these, um, not necessarily uh, going into them intensely, but describing all the ones that I know about all the ones that I'm in and have had experience with, um, not exactly instructions uh, on how to upload and get into each one of those. That's going to be a course that I'm working on. But this is an ebook that basically just lists the main question I get, which is this. Do you know about what, what libraries are good, what libraries are bad, what are the libraries? Most people just don't even know them all. And so a list like this uh, is, is pretty good. But to answer his question uh, as quick as possible, which one are successful in terms of sales? I think the top three that he's got there, uh, Motion Array, Audio Jungle, and Pond5, are probably going to be where you make the most income uh, in stock music. Uh, as far as the what we would consider non-exclusive, um, regular tier stock music, not talking about tiers like art list or music bed or things like that, which all have different rules and regulations and different things, but just general stock music libraries. Uh, this is about right for me. Uh, Motion Array, Audio Jungle, Pond 5. The next one for me that's not on this list is Audio Sparks, um, but mm -hmm. that's because I've had a few bigger sales on, on there. And then after that, n none of these have really paid me music bay I, I don't know what that is yeah I've the never music, heard of music case bay. i've heard of that and I've, i think i've applied but i haven't heard back motion elements i have made zero on in one year zero um and i've got a hundred and something tracks up there uh, deposit photos i've made about 30 bucks but i don't get paid until you get 50 bucks there and 100 audio i've kind of stopped putting stuff in there in favor of putting it on v fine but with v fine i've only made about 43 something it's not dollars but um and i and on 100 audio i've made a little bit but it would take a lot more to to get paid by 100 audio since they don't pay until 280 dollars or something like that so i i think his his list is right here and i think uh there are some that are a complete waste of time so far i believe that music grid is a complete waste of time um yeah, I, it's, I mean, it's funny. It's like uh, it's hard to really kind of like say that certain libraries are a total waste of time. Like if you look at, for example, he has one of the, the libraries that he has no sales with is Vfine, uh, and we've we chatted with uh, you know several um, uh, people in the Discord server who one of them in particular is doing really well on Vfine. Um, yeah. I know Daniel is uh, is you know Carizales has done uh, pretty well on Vfine. He's gotten a payout from them. Um, Music Grid. I I I've literally only spoken to one person. Ever who's had a sale on Music Grid, um, and there's a lot of people um, who have co you know, collectively told me that they have never made a sale there. So um, maybe a waste of time. Uh, you know, it is certainly for me. I'm, I'm not going to upload any music to them. Uh, I don't think they get enough traffic, and I think that is maybe one of the concerns with some of these libraries is that they just don't get a lot of traffic anymore. Um, Dreams Time is very big. Yeah, uh, it's a very big library. I've had about twelve dollars in sales there. Um, feeding them about, I think I got about a hundred tracks up there. Um, but but it's not. Correct me if I'm wrong, but it's not like a music centered library, is it? Right. They do lots of different things. And they that might be. I mean, and, and it's stuff. like Pond Five is the same way in a in, in a sense. You know, it's like so not is motion exactly. elements. I mean, so yeah. is motion array. That's true. Yeah. But motion, motion array, array has but if you way look, more. But if you look at the stats of uh, like a motion That's array, true. like music is, uh, I think it's their, it's the it, it accounts Second for the biggest. most of the revenue. Or, oh yeah, because their first the, the first one is the is those like After Effects templates. I think yeah, um, they yeah. account for a big chunk of their revenue. But music is second, so yeah. people and go it's there. Big for number. Music. It was a million last year, last right. month, I believe. Yeah, a million it's huge. dollars. Um, so I've made money on Song Trader every year, including this year. I've I've 
I probably make three times the amount of the fee that I pay. And even the account that I don't have, that I don't pay on, which is just a free account, you can have a free account on SongTrader. Mm -hmm. I have so many songs in there doing so many things with monetization that I still have made money on, on a, an account I don't pay for there. So SongTrader does pretty well for me. And I think it's a, it's a way to get from what I understand, and I've been talking with different people in this uh, industry who make money uh, and li make their livings in licensing, and they are seeing that, or they are saying that SongTrader is a valid place that music supervisors come looking for indie songs. Yeah, I've heard the same thing. So uh, yeah. I, I think you have to be in there. Plus, they have all these little cool options. They have really decent distribution, too, to Spotify and stuff like that. I use it. Yeah. So they have a lot of... As a matter of fact, I should have an album out today, but uh, we'll have to go look and see in a minute. But they have a lot of different ways that you can make money from overhead music, and I, I did a whole video on this, so you can see it at the Make Music Income YouTube channel, all about Song Trader. If you have any questions on that, but yeah, um, yeah that's all I have to say because, I, I, like I said, I'm putting a whole ebook out on this, and then I'm going to do a a pretty intense uh, bunch of modules on how to put stuff t up to each of these libraries and those modules will be in the production music academy hopefully once i get them done so yeah so i mean it, uh, yeah just to conclude that question i mean bjorn it's like uh i think you know people's experience with uh, different libraries is quite subjective and and you may you might find that it's not worth the effort uh for some of these libraries and uh you might want to put more time into uh into writing for the libraries that you are finding some success with. Yeah. Um, I don't know, but it's, uh, it, it does, it does vary, uh, from person to person quite a bit. Um, but, um, I finally got back into the 30 songs a month, uh, a month club on audio jungle. So I am uploading like a beast I right got now. It. That is amazing. <laughs> I don't know how you do it, man. That's a song but, a day. Uh, Folks, well, no, no, no. I mean, I've already, I, I was, I was, I, I could only upload two a month for a while because my percentage went down. You know, you have to have a seventy percent acceptance uh, percentage. On, oh, sorry, I'm sorry. On, I now I know what you're talking about. Um, right, and you so were, you were. Uh, I messed up with punished. some classical things. I was punished, and finally <laughs> they let me back in, and I had enough uh, that was accepted. So I am throwing all sorts of stuff up there. Hope uh, mainly cool. Christmas music right now, trying to get as much Christmas up there as possible. Because as I said in my holiday mu vi music video that you need to go watch on YouTube, but uh, yeah, well. this next week, the week before Christmas, the week before any holiday is when most holiday sales occur. You might get some the month before Christmas because of Christmas, but if it's Veterans Day or if it's 4th of July or if it's Valentine's Day or if it's whatever the holiday is, most of those sales are gonna come in that seven days before all the way up to that day and maybe even a little after that day as sales register. Yeah. That's what I've noticed at least on all of those. So I'm trying to get everything in by the 15th so that, uh, and, and live by like later in the, like seven days before Christmas so that there's enough time for people to search and find some Christmas songs and, and make some money. So cool. Make yeah. music income. Make music which, by the money. way is our title. All right. Well, I think that's it for this episode. Um, yeah, good, good chat. That was great. So uh, we'll be back next week with a whole new subject. We're going to be talking, I think, next week is I was going to talk about Christmas stuff, but I've kind of done a video on that. So we'll have to figure out what we're going to talk about next week. But it will certainly be about making music income and licensing and all sorts of fun stuff. So we hope you join us. And Steve, we'll see you next week. Yeah, we'll see you next time, guys. Thanks for listening. All right. Bye-bye.